Hi, I'm Mike. Ho hopefully by the next time we get our next job, my beard won't be twice as long and it'll just be same length. How's everybody doing? My name is Ryan Avila. I'm a fire captain for Cal Fire. I currently work out of the Tuolumne Calaveras unit at Columbia Helitech on Copter 404. Uh, I spent a long time in my career here in this area, mostly out of Lake County. And I was one of the first uh, company officers on one of the first fire engines that arrived at the Tubbs fire. I was at the Dixie and uh, many other uh, major incidents that we've had in the state. Hi, I'm Jackie Jorgerson, and I am the founder and executive director of Volunteer Fire Foundation. Um, I don't always sound like this. I'm on day one million of the cold that will not die. I'm beyond contagious, don't worry. <laughs> um, but you know, our goal, our mission is, in short, to recruit new volunteer firefighters, retain the ones that we have, and protect their health and well-being along the way. Hi everyone, my name is Bailey Farron and I'm the co-founder and CEO at a company called Perimeter. Our mission is to ensure that everyone has real-time information during natural disasters, fires, floods, etc. And it's something that I started after the Tubbs fire because when my family and I were being evacuated, I thought that first responders and firefighters that are local like my dad had all the information they need to make decisions. They just didn't necessarily have a way to get that to residents like me. But after the fire, when I started asking a lot of questions of our public safety agencies, what I found is most of them are relying on paper maps and radios primarily for all of their situational awareness. And so we started Perimeter to bridge the gap that exists not only between public safety agencies and the public, but also between public safety agencies and each other. And a uh, side note, so um, last, in 2022, for some reason, Forbes named me the um, one of the most 50 most impactful women over 50 in the United States. And at the same year, and there's, it's not a coincidence, it's just like a beautiful thing, um, Bailey was named um, by Forbes as 30 under 30. So I just want to give her a big round of applause for that because <laughs> very sweet. Well, you know, to be a female tech, uh, co-founder that's super hard and it, it is a world dominated mostly by men and so I just always like to give a little amplification to Bailey because she's been on this circuit with me and um, and then I know her mom very well too for uh, well she's been in it for five years and then also like you know Jackie you are she started to can you just say really quickly though because how when you started and with an idea, all the all of this is an idea. Yeah. So Volunteer Fire Foundation, the seed was first planted during the Tubbs fire. Um, you know, and, and just a quick moment of contextual background. I was in New York during 9-11. I was brought to Ground Zero by my mom's best friend, who was a chaplain who was ministering to the first responders and the search and rescue folks. And um, and I took a lot of those chemicals into my body that I did not find until 2021. I'm going to put a pin in that because it's relevant to the work that we do. Um, but, you know, I so and I saw the horrification of the firefighters rise and fall. And I saw what happened in the sort of literal and metaphorical ash after that horrific event. And they were forgotten and they're still left to die. I was in New York at, a, at Rescue 3, the second busiest department in New York City over Thanksgiving last year and heard the announcement go through of yet another fallen 9-11 firefighter from cancer. So it felt very personal to me and weirdly familiar when suddenly we were under a di different kind of attack and my thought immediately went to the first responders. I was so grateful to see so much rising up to support the victims and I thought, well, what do these guys need? And at that time, I just very kind of ignorantly was like, this is the perfect time to reach out to my firefighter friend and ask how we can support them. And he gave me that, like what I realize now is a stock answer of like, we're fine, we trained for this. But before we got off the phone, he said, hey, Jackie, just if you're serious about wanting to help firefighters, when all of this is over, please remember your volunteers. They're trying to do all of this on a pancake breakfast a year. And my first thought was like, no offense, I'm sure you know what you're talking about, but that can't possibly be true. And, you know, but I thought, okay, I'll, I'll take you at your word. And I started putting together a fundraiser. I thought like, okay, like we can do that. We can raise some money for the volunteers. And then it took, you know, dates came together. They fell apart. Life happened. It took until 2019 with the Kincaid fire for me to revisit that. 
And when I started thinking a little more deeply, like who gets the giant novelty check? Like who, like what's the nonprofit on the ground that understands what all of the volunteer fire companies and agencies that have volunteers are, what their needs are and how they can best be resourced. And so um, I did some research and found that there wasn't actually a nonprofit in the entire United States that supports volunteer firefighters on the ground in any kind of grassroots way. You just have individual agencies. They're like little prairie dogs. They pop their heads out of their hole. They're completely isolated, and they go back down underground. And um, and so I met with you know a local chief who I call the patron saint of this project. Chief Aker is like the second early fire uh, chief adopter, but the first. Um, you know, we sat down, and I was like, "Is this a fundraiser? or Is this a nonprofit?" He said, "It's a nonprofit." And I was like, "Shit!" I was really hoping you weren't going to say that. And my next call went to this incredible woman. Um, I had heard about her work after the fire. I did not key that part up, just, what's that? No, 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 not key no, that part no. up. This, but truly, I mean, when we talk about outside the fire sector, this was our very first adopter. And I called thinking I would leave a, vo a voicemail for one of her support staff or on her, on her message and, you know, machine and she picked up and I was like, oh, here we go. And she cut me off maybe five seconds into my pitch and you're probably about to cut me off again. That's totally fine. Um, but she just said, I'm just gonna, she said, Jackie, I'm just gonna stop you here. It's a yes. I was looking for a fiscal sponsor. I needed a safe shelter. I needed an umbrella under which we could operate until we got our act together and got our own 501c3 status. And Jennifer provided that. So thank you, we wouldn't be here without you. I love cool people with good ideas. So, and then also with, um, ba well, I wish it's so I'm sad that Steve is, is sick because it's actually wraps the two of you together for sure. Is that um, Chief Aker was really like the first um, chief to take on um, the idea of perimeter too. Can you quickly tell us what perimeter does too? Like, like specifically that it grabs the information? So Perimeter is a mapping platform that first responders use to annotate maps in real time. So they can add points, routes, and polygons during an incident, but they can also do pre-planning in advance. So whether that's dropping hazards in the middle of an incident, it's used very often for road closures, et cetera, um, but also in advance to put things like evacuation zones or or high risk zones, et cetera. And it's a way for first responders to have an app that allows them to really easily share information between each other and then push information to a web app. So basically a link that residents can go to without having to download anything, without having to opt into something because our opt-in rates, despite how many incidents we've had in California are still on average at about 5% for a lot of these alert and warning systems. And so making sure that we can reach people, that the first responders can reach people with information without needing them to opt in, without needing them to download something is super important to making sure that people can actually access that information that exists. Situational awareness is just huge for how we're going to do. So I'm going to ask you, um, Ryan, as a person who is Cal Fire has been way over uh, uh, subscribed over the past couple of years. We did talk a little bit about that, about how they've had to expand. Can you talk about what you not only would you like to see, but what in, what things Cal Fire has done from your perspective that have really changed um, how you are doing your job, but also meeting the moment too? Yeah, definitely. Um, in the last couple of years, Cal Fire has done a lot to incorporate new technologies into um, our traditionally boots on the ground, you know, laying hose, a lot more physical work, right? So a lot of that is AIs, the cameras that have gone into being able to see fires from the emergency command centers and make a decision on what resources are going to be dispatched to those fires. Um, we've had those camera technologies in the past, but now using AI to model better, um, that's one thing. They have done a lot to get technology into the equipment. So now we have mobile data terminals in all of the fire engines so you could see where the resources are when you're on a fire, which gives you a lot more situational awareness. Um, they've created applications, one of which is called Tactical Analyst, which pulls in data from all of the different programs that the department has and allows the boots on the ground to be able to see perimeters, to be able to see areas, models. Um, we've done a lot more in modeling. We've worked with a company that's based out of San Diego to be able to incorporate modeling um, called the Wildfire Analyst. 
And so the technology is there. It's just figuring out how it works to improve firefighting, right? Because ultimately, to put a fire out, you need to have people on the ground laying hose and cutting line, right? So how does the technology incorporate into that to be able to make that more efficient? All right, so um, Mike, from a you know from an innovation point of view, um, one of the things that I didn't know about before Jackie told me was um, that you know that and I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this so you can fix it if you need to is that I did not it makes sense but we all know now that the wildfire chemicals that we burn during a fire are and we're inhaling them we don't even know what they're doing to our bodies USC Davis is doing a study but by the time that it helps other people we will have already fully implemented all that PVC um, we didn't even know when our mega fire burn you know started I was like do I need a mask yeah I mean you know like it was we were literally like starting at the very beginning I also didn't know that with firefighters that they have chemicals make sense but I hadn't thought about it all over their uniforms and what it is and they have to use a special machine which the volunteer firefighters did not have before um, in order to decontaminate do you think that there is an application for your technology that might be integrated into the uniforms that people or the, the PPE essentially for lack of a better term that firefighters are using out in the field that actually might protect their health Yes. So we, our, our technology is the, a platform, right? So it's a particle that can be added into lots of different matrices. We recently got done testing uh, transportation of lithium ion batteries in cardboard boxes. The, the cardboard box has a liner, which is a fabric liner, very similar to, you know, a, a cotton or the, the uniform of a firefighter. Uh, it's flexible. It's probably not the most comfortable thing to wear, but the particle, when it goes inside the liner and you have batteries that are inside of a box, so you have the outside of a box and then you have a liner that goes inside. It's a fabric liner. When you close the box and the test is 20 lithium ion batteries that need to burn off, um, we lasted, we took the box from about two minutes to 45 minutes and then the box was intact after that. So we can um, incorporate our technology into things like fabrics, cotton, textiles, et cetera. And because it's 100% inorganic, the only toxicity that arises is from the uniform itself. That's why you're all on the panel together. Does that make sense to you all now? It's just because usually, would you ever be in the same room together? Well, except for you two might be in the same room as Steve Aker. But I mean, you wouldn't be, correct? Okay. So um, Ryan, just quickly back to you. Uh, when you hear about these three people on either side of you working hard, thinking about like what could keep you safer, um, does that fulfill some of your wish list, or are there more wish lists that we should know about that you would really that you that you and and I know you're official Cal Fire, and I know there's like some Cal Fire you know big wiggies in this room, and I know that, so we're not going to hold it against you no matter what you said. But um, but really though, how does that? How do you respond to that? And what more can we do to keep you safer? Uh, that's kind of a hard question, but, um, I, I like those. I, yeah, I, I think we're making a step in the right direction between technology, um, figuring out the, the state of California has put a lot of resources into wildfire technology in the last couple of years and, and trying to figure these things out and doing the research to figure out what is going to be the best as far as uniforms, as far as recovery of the firefighters, as far as the technology to help the firefighters. So, um, as far as needs right now, um, nothing off the top of my head, but I think we're moving in the right direction. And were you aware that these other things existed or, or these other possibilities existed or? We hear about them, uh, but a lot of these things, as, as you know, take some time, right? So it takes time to filter through these things. Um, the state of California is a very big organization and it, it takes time to uh, work through a lot of these processes. So, um, we hear about them, but it takes time. For context, we have 40 million people here, and in Oregon, they have about a tenth of that amount. So sometimes I tell people, you should just work in Oregon. It's so much easier in that sense, for sure. Um, so, and when th another thing I learned from um, Jackie, when she first, you know, I was very happy to be her her fiscal um, sponsor. It wasn't a, it wasn't a heavy lift. It was it was wonderful, but. Um, she started doing wellness clinics too. And so, can you talk about those a little bit? It's the thing I'm proudest of. So and she just got a big FEMA contract, so you should talk about that too. Yeah, we were just awarded a 
a half million dollar FEMA grant, our first. Um, and it's a CFER grant, which is so, I butcher this all the time, staffing for adequate um, firefighter emergency response. I do it right. Okay, nailed it. Um, and, you know, we were working with a, a fabulous grant writer who kind of knows the ins and outs of this, and she was like, you're going to get funded for this, you're going to get funded for that. It was things that we had talked about, you know, my advisors and I in the fire service from day one, from that first coffee meeting. It was, you know, so it's PPE reimbursement, um, the NFPA physicals, uh, the, you know, um, driver operator 1A1B trainings, um, kind of advanced career trainings, fire academy scholarships, all these things which are totally needed, a, a countywide recruitment campaign. Um, very necessary, very needed not cutting edge and certainly not protecting firefighters as holistic individuals for whom the greatest threats are cancer and suicide. So when we went into technical review, which I was told, okay, that this is great news. This is this means you're getting something we just don't know what yet. And my, you know, the woman reviewing my application called me up, Katice, shout out, she was amazing. She spent hours with me that she did not have to try and fit a couple of our requests, these round pegs into FEMA's square holes. And so she said, mental health resiliency, which by the way, that's Bailey's mama's program. She's our mental health resiliency partner. We bring her in to do trainings that give very pragmatic, very real world tools and skills to firefighters. For example, situational awareness. Oh, you're heading to a call. It's a bad one. Your hands are shaking uncontrollably. There's a breath for that. Oh, you're waking up. It's two in the morning. You can't stop looping about what happened to that one child on that call you went to last week. There's something for that too. So that's what she does. We also do these integrative wellness trainings. We are blessed here in Sonoma County to have two of the premier doctors who work in environmental medicine, specifically with firefighters, to get all of that toxic crap that's in their bodies out. They've been doing this for a collective 20 years. They are incredibly proficient at it. Um, and so we, and we, <laughs> and earlier this year, launched my dream program, which was a 16-week firefighter detoxification program, where these people, we took 10 firefighters to start in our first program, enrolled them as patients of their environmental medicine clinic, tested them before, during, and after the 16 weeks. We are still in kind of the statistical analysis phase, but I will say the high-level results are beyond what we'd even hoped for. Um, I'll throw out just a couple things. Number one, the number of toxins that they tested for that were in the red, meaning 95th percentile or higher, that number across all 10 participants reduced by 74% in the 16 weeks. Um, interesting, this is a wine country thing. Glyphosate was the biggest offender, Roundup, because we all probably have a baseline to begin with, just living where we live in this beautiful place, number one. Number two, tanks of it burned during the vineyard fires. Number three, Cal Fire, all love, all love, sprays it in forest land, to my knowledge and understanding, as a fuel reduction method. We were able to reduce glyphosate levels by 93% in 16 weeks. What's wild is that even with that reduction, there were still folks that had up to two times the 95th percentile, even with that reduction. Um, and then finally, and this links in with the PFAS that you were talking about with the chemicals that are in the gear, PFAS are called the forever chemicals because it is scientifically recognized that these chemicals do not budge out of whatever ecosystem they land in, whether that's the environment outside or internally in our bodies. The PFAS moved. It spiked when it was supposed to spike, and it dropped when it was supposed to drop. To our knowledge, there's no other study being done like this anywhere in the States or beyond. We've looked. We can't find anything else like it. It's a fully integrative approach. Um, and you know, and that was born out of these single day clinics that we've been doing, these integrative wellness clinics that we run all over the county where I jokingly call it like 
spa day or like like firefighter like wellness practitioner speed dating where it's like people show up they have two hours and they can move from station to station to station doing everything from massage chiropractic acupuncture into like naturopathic medicine um breathing treatments for their lungs um ivs for immunity and detoxification leaving with goodie bags of supplements to support their detox pathways all of these things fema couldn't grasp that so the only thing we were not funded for were these wellness clinics, the things where you look at the, the you know, the uh, questionnaire, kind of pre and post event questionnaire that we hand out. We've heard things like, if this was around 30 years ago, maybe my firefighter dad would still be alive. Um, things like, I have the feeling that these are the things that are going to save my life. And when I talked to my FEMA rep, she was like, so help me figure out, like, this is a recruitment and retention grant. Like, how does this tie in? And I said, well, I don't know. I just kind of think like maybe the most straightforward way to retain firefighters is to help them not die before their time. And she's like, yeah, but <laughs> like they didn't have the pre-existing buckets and it's got to go in a bucket. So um, this is what we're working toward and it's what we're dealing with. It's a little bit of an uphill battle, but the the acceptance on the ground from the agencies, and we actually get a ton of Cal Fire folks showing up for all of our events, which is amazing. They find out and they just turn up like whole crews at a time, um, and we welcome them with open arms. And you know, so we're chipping away. And the good news that I'll finish with is just you know the last thing that the the rep from FEMA said is, look, you're probably basically you're probably not going to get funded for this this time. She said, but next week we meet to figure out what the buckets are for next year. And you can bet that we'll be talking about this. And I'm, I'm outing myself here. When Jackie told me she wanted to do these clinics and detox, people, I was like, uh, um, how are you? Well, um, so, you know, Jackie, like, how are you going to get these firefighters? You can't even get them to admit that they might be having a job that's a little harder than everybody else's. You know, like when you run into them, especially after a fire, they get heroized. And when they get heroized, your mom taught me this. I did not invite your mom specifically only because I didn't want to always I want didn't want you overshadowed in any way and she's kind of a big deal and so is Bailey quite frankly, but um, getting them to adopt something that wasn't you know a piece of equipment or something like that and getting them to actually engage because literally we can't we heroize them here and by doing that we isolate them and by isolating firefighters we actually increase their incidences of having things like suicide of having things like drinking problems of having all of these other issues i did not know that because i would every time i saw a firefighter after our fires i would just burst into tears turns out not helpful you know, <laughs> for me, great though. A little embarrassing, but great. And so it was just really important. So um, Jackie sort of taught me that, you know, she was like, yeah, well, that's nice, Jen, but I'm just going to keep on trucking down the road and do this thing. And she did it. And then i have obviously following very closely and they are adopting it and they do want it. And it is one of those things. I remember um, being on a I ride along with a Cal Fire guy because I worked for the county right after the fires. And the whole time, um, he was, he had a little cough the whole time. And I was like, are you, you know, are you okay? He's like, oh, I always have this. And, and we have to think about, you know, how do we protect their skin through new technologies? How do we protect, you know, what, what actual equipment we give them, how we treat them, but also how do we protect them? So Bailey, talk about your opportunities and barriers in this field of adopting this technology because your dad's a firefighter and your mom is a paramedic or was a paramedic and intimately familiar. She does peer-to-peer -peer, um, mental health, um, PTSD work, but in your own work though, which is informed by them, what are your barriers and opportunities? Yeah, I, th I think that folks in public safety, and Chris Godley can probably attest to this, are constantly um, under a barrage of vendors and people trying to get them to use new tools. And I think when you show up and you say, I have the solution you've been looking for, it's kind of, it's already exhausting, like from the onset of that conversation. And something that we learned really early on is to show up and not assume that we have the answers, but, you know, have a lot of questions that were really willing to 
you know, not just sit with in the, the first few minutes of the conversation, but how can we get deeper and deeper and deeper to really understand what they need and not just assume like, hey, we have the best thing since sliced bread. You need to buy it. Instead, our approach is really different. We started with, you know, the first version of our product and we work really closely with all of our public safety agencies um, to constantly be asking, like, how can we improve, you know, give us any specifics, be vague, but regardless, like, help us understand your problems. And I think that really helps us overcome the barriers and the resistance that people have to new technology. And, you know, there's this quote in the fire industry that says, um, the only, th the, uh, the, there are only two things that firefighters hate. That's um, the way things are and change. And I don't think that's unique to the fire service. I think that's just a human it's thing. It's true. <laughs> so I think everyone is, is resistant to change, but I think recent events have become so impactful and so drastic in terms of the severity and frequency that people are willing to say, okay, we have problems. We need to solve them. We're open to solutions. Let's talk. And you never show up to any wildfire community and be like, I know everything you need to know, because that's literally the last thing they ever, ever want to hear. Because it also um, says that your situation or your fire isn't your fire. Somebody said when we re when we rebranded, they're like, you should be called after the fires. I'm like, not a chance. Because everywhere we go, what we hear is after the fire. They don't want to talk about other people's fires. They can talk about it later. But right now, they've just seen the unimaginable become their reality. And so they need that respect in the center of it. So I'm, I love that. So I'd like to open this up for questions, unless you have a, a comment before. Go ahead. Please. If I could just add on to that, there's a saying in the fire service is 200 years of tradition unimpeded by progress, right? So things <laughs> don't change rapidly in the fire service. Uh, ultimately, like I said, it takes hose and water to put the fires out. So getting people to see that there's other ways that could help in addition to just that uh, could be difficult for sure. It's a, it's a cultural thing. It's always going to boil down to needing people too. And we, we could talk about, well, I can go into AB 109 and California state policy and why we lost a lot of our hand crews. Um, but we always need people and these are systems and ideas that will actually help us recruit and retain firefighters and keep them healthy too. So questions for the audience. Hi, my name is Harry Hubble. I'm with Fire Safe Sonoma. Jackie, I guess this question is kind of more focused towards you. Do y'all have any help from anyone manufacturing these chemicals or, you know, any like some of the biggest offenders in Sonoma County when it comes to like massive amounts of chemicals that have been set on fire? Or is this truly just like you? And <laughs> it's just us. Um, no, you know, so this pilot program was our first. Um, we're the second one launches in December, um, hopefully with bigger numbers. So we can then go to major research institutions and get real money and, yeah, get, get into some juicy stuff. Um, so this was our first time even really seeing what was inside folks. And some of it wasn't surprising. Some of it was. We didn't expect Roundup to be number one and just so extensively so. Um, and so we haven't even really had a chance to kind of wrap our head around what's next. And then, you know, there are just so many elements of like, you know, and what every firefighter I've ever talked to, it's like even the ones that participated in the study, one of my questions in like the post game wrap up was, how do you feel about this? Like, does this give you like a new lease on life? You know, because there's such a fatalistic <laughs> vibe to firefighters when they talk about the risks. They're like, yeah, it's probably going to happen at some point, and it's what I signed up for, and they accept that incredibly. Um, but And they were even still in that kind of mode of like, yeah, like, feels good, but we'll see, you know? And so the questions that we have are sort of like, the risks are what they are. They're not going to stop doing it. Thank God for all of us, right? Um, so how do we mitigate every moment that we can? And then, and then like, what are the higher level conversations we have? I think the first step right now is just more data, more data. Um, and then, and then beyond that, that's when we get more leverage. That's when we can start, um, hopefully taking it not just to the unions, because thankfully in California, at least our firefighter unions tend to wield a fair amount of power in Sacramento. Um, but yeah, like how do we get legislative change? And then what are the alternatives? Because if not 
Roundup, then what? Because the fuels still need management. So like how do, you know, so it's just a vast question. Um, you know, we're not going to change what's burning in a car fire. We're not going to change what's burning in a house fire, in the wooey, in a wild fire. But what we can change is like, what are the protocols? How are you responding immediately after? And for volunteers, I'm over volunteer firefighters not having the specialized washing machines, for example, putting their toxin crusted turnouts in the trunk of their car going home and washing that PPE in their family's washing machine with their toddler's footy jammies. Like done, like there, there are certain things that we can absolutely, now that we know, start making changes, telling the story, putting the bullhorn on it, getting funding, but it's just, it's such a multi-pronged thing. So the chemical companies specifically and what their role is, unfortunately, typically what they do is they go, oh, our bad, sorry, sorry, sorry. They take it off the market, they add a molecule, which typically makes it even more carcinogenic, and they're like, fixed it, use this one instead. It's not fixed, it's often even worse um, for, for life of all forms. So it, it's a lot, it's a lot of the, it's a great question and I wish I had a simple answer, but yeah, lots of parts to that. We have about uh, two minutes left, so here's what I would like. Um, Bailey, um, give us your last thoughts and if there was a question you wish or something that you would like to add that I didn't get to, if I could go down the line, but I'm gonna start with you um, from this panel. Yeah, well, I'd actually love to respond to what you said, Ryan, about the 200 years unimpeded by progress. I, I love this, and I, I think that it's so important to keep that in mind as we like come forth with new solutions, that if we're able to understand like the current workflow processes, tools, that the groups that we're working with, the communities that they're using, it'll be so much more easy. Like It'll be so much easier for us to actually show up and integrate some of what we're working on as opposed to acting as if you know we have a silver bullet because I don't think that exists. I think the solution is really based on, like the good solutions are really based on like integrating and working with the existing workflow and tools. So there's that. And then I also want to say that we're in the process right now of deploying in different regions all over the United States. And if you're from one of those regions that um, you feel like you could really benefit from having access to real-time information during incidents, whether on the public safety side or on the public side, I'd love to talk to you. And lastly, Chris Godley, thank you for making it possible for us to be working here in Sonoma County. I know you're off at Stanford, go Bears, but um, I'm super grateful for that, thank you. I think I probably talked more than my fair share, so I'm going to pass, but thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you all for being here. I just want to say thank you guys all for allowing us to come and speak. Um, just something to keep in mind. I know it's been touched on, but uh, just just remember that when it comes to responders, um, there's injuries that you can't see on the outside, right? And that aren't really talked about. Um, so sometimes people just need to talk and be listened to, right? And so if you're ever talking to somebody and they have something to say, just just listen to what they have to say. Yeah, so I've never been in a wildfire, and uh, your stories over the last two days have personalized it for me. The closest I've gotten to a disaster was Hurricane Harvey, and I remember how scary that was. Um, and we, had, we were about a half an inch away from losing our house. Uh, I remember staying up for 48 hours straight with sump pumps all around my house, trying to funnel the water to the street. Um, carrying all of our furniture upstairs. And I remember looking over at my kids and my wife just playing a little game. And I said, the stuff doesn't matter as long as they're safe. And I, I know you all care about your infrastructure, but keeping your family safe because of the, the dangerous nature of the fire. That's what we wanna provide as nanotech. And we can't thank you enough for giving us a stage and making this very, very real and personal for me. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Appreciate you. Round of applause.